Better? Do you hear me? Doesn't seem to. Does it change anything? No. <laughs> <laughs> so you have to shout. Okay, I'll, I'll try to shout. So okay, so so <coughs> the, the way uh, that it forms their uh, their body axis is uh, by a process that involves uh, posterior elongation, and that's at later stages than the ones that uh, Ray discussed. Uh, um, uh, involves a, a particular structure which is called the, the tail bud and uh, which acts as a, a stem cell zone or a, a, an area containing progenitor, a bit like what uh, Elliot discussed for the, the meristems stems in, in plants. Of course, there are some uh, very, very significant differences between plants and, and animals, as you will see in a minute, in the sense that here the cells can exchange neighbors and move around, which they cannot do in plants. <coughs> linked by the cell walls. But conceptually, the idea is a bit similar in the sense that what you, what you get is a distal growth from this black zone here that progress, uh, progressively produces cells that become organized into a pattern structure. And so in, in vertebrate, the, the pattern structure uh, uh, appears as a, an elongated rod with uh, a periodic anatomical modules, which are called segments. And, and this is uh, uh, the way the, the posterior body is formed. So, so here what I'm showing you is just a, a movie that illustrates uh, this process. This is a chicken embryo at two days of development, where you see uh, the progressive uh, elongation that takes place. And while you see that initially there was some convergence extension in the process uh, at the later phases, which correspond to the formation of the more posterior structures, you see that there is very little of uh, uh, convergent processes that uh, take place. And, and you can actually quantify this and, uh, and show that uh, uh, convergence is uh, uh, much less significant than it was uh, at the initial stages. And so that means that it's a bit difficult to explain this sustained elongation that, that's going to generate uh, the entire uh, uh, contingent of, of vertebrae and, and other structures. <coughs> 
simply by the uh, process of uh, convergence extension by mediolateral intercalation. And so for many years, we've been trying to understand uh, this, uh, uh, this process uh, because one of the reasons why uh, we got interested in this is because we're interested in the, uh, the fate and the, the, the formation of a particular tissue, which is called the paraxial mesoderm. And so the paraxial mesoderm is this tissue here, which is shown in red, and it forms at the level of the tip bud, and then it's going to generate a tissue which is going to be important in, in a minute, which is called the presomitic mesoderm, which will form the segmented structures of the embryo, which are called the somites. And so eventually the somites give rise to uh, these two major types of derivatives, uh, the skeletal muscle and the uh, axial skeleton. And so here I want to show you uh, a movie which illustrates not only uh, how the, uh, the posterior part of the embryo is formed, but also the fate of uh, the paraxial mesoderm uh, uh, cells and, and, and how the, the uh, territory that contains the progenitor of uh, the cells in uh, uh, initially the, the primitive streak and then the tail bud will generate what will form uh, this tissue which I just uh, uh, showed you. I think, can we get the lights down a bit? <coughs> So here you see these are the cells uh, which are the precursors of the paraxial mesoderm have been labeled. And you see that they, they exit this uh, uh, posterior uh, territory uh, to form the columns of the paraxial mesoderm that uh, differentiate and, and uh, become patterned into somites. So I'm just replaying it uh, to you. But what, what you can see also is that there is a little uh, convergence uh, uh, that takes place at this level, but uh, it becomes uh, quite minimal as uh, the embryo continues to elongate. And so again, uh, it's, it's quite difficult to explain uh, this uh, very striking uh, elongation that takes place simply based on the type of behavior that uh, Ray discussed uh, in his talk. And so, a while ago, uh, Bertrand Benasserov, when he was uh, in my lab, was interested in this question. And what he decided to do is to uh, perform a series of ablations of different regions uh, in the posterior end of the embryo to try to uh, identify the key uh, elements that control this process of posterior elongation. So for instance, what he did was to either remove all the axial structures uh, posteriorly, so that includes the entire uh, primitive streak at this stage. And uh, a bit to our surprise, what we saw is that it does not prevent uh, the elongation of the axis. The, the hole essentially gets closed, but uh, elong the elongation of the body axis uh, continues. In contrast, when he removed uh, bilaterally the territory, the, the posterior territory of the presomitic mesoderm, which is uh, the, the tissue I was uh, illustrating in the beginning, then what he found is that uh, elongation is essentially stalled which was uh, pointing to uh, an important role of uh, the, the paraxial mesoderm in the control of these elongation movements. So we became interested in trying to uh, figure out how, yeah? Is there recovery of this process once the gap closes? Like, do, do you actually, uh, like, do you continue somatogenesis? Yeah, eventually, it yes, if, if, when it, it, it recovers after a while. So most of what I'm going to discuss is actually fairly short term, between 5, 10 hours, the formation of a few somites. If you remove these regions after, you might have secondary processes that, that will interfere differently. <coughs> and then uh, with Paul Francois and, and, and Bertrand, we started to look at the behavior of cells in uh, the, the presomitic mesoderm. So what Bertrand did is to label cells with a nuclear label and then monitor their movement uh, in the tissue in this uh, 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 presomitic mesoderm, the tissue that when ablated blocks the elongation movement. And, uh, and, and what Paul could show is that there was a very uh, uh, significant gradient of cell motility uh, in, this, in the uh, presomitic mesoderm running from anterior to posterior with a peak of uh, uh, motility which was found in this posterior region 
uh, that uh, controls the elongation movement. And so, so this is a, just a scheme that shows the tracks of the cells, and uh, uh, this represents their uh, preferential uh, direction of migration. And what you can see is that there is a, a striking gradient in uh, uh, the, the motility with a preferred direction towards the posterior. So it seems like the more posterior you go in the tissue, the more the cells are moving faster into the posterior direction, which you could interpret as essentially the cells migrating directionally and dragging uh, the, the posterior end of the embryo, putting on, on the posterior <coughs> end of the embryo in this way. But <coughs> what, what we did next was to uh, look at tissue deformation. And for that, we used the trick that was initially developed by Charlie Little at KUMET, where you can uh, label the extracellular matrix with a, 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 an antibody against uh, fibronectin, which has been labeled with a, a red uh, fluorochrome. And this is what you can see here. And at the same time, you can uh, label cells of the presomitic mesoderm here by electroporation of uh, an H2B GFP uh, construct, which is going to produce a fluorescent protein in the, in the nucleus of these cells. And, and so in this embryo, what you can do is you can track at the same time the, the fate of the extracellular matrix, the fibronectin, which will reflect the deformation of the tissue and the movement of the cells, because the cells have an active movement in this context, unlike the, the plant cells again. And so you can see that the cells, as I just said, are very active posteriorly, and they move around in the uh, uh, extracellular matrix. And when you look at higher magnification and you track the fate of the particles of fibronectin and the fate of the, uh, uh, the cells, you see that the tracks are actually uh, very different. And in fact, <clears throat> what you can do is to, to score uh, the, the tracks in the, of, of the fibronectin and, and then uh, compare them to uh, the, the tracks of the cells. You can subtract, in fact, the, uh, the movement of the extracellular matrix, which represents the deformation of the tissue from the actual cell movement. And so Paul uh, Francois did that. And what you end up with is uh, uh, once you've subtra subtracted the, uh, the movement of the fibronectin to the movement of the cells, is you end up still with a gradient of motility, but uh, you completely lose the directionality of mo the movement, which means that the posterior drag of the cells that we were seeing on the, these initial movements actually represents the deformation of the tissue and not uh, actual movement of the cells. So in the end, what you're left up with is uh, with a gradient of uh, random cell motility, which would be very much akin to uh, cell diffusion. And, and Paul actually uh, 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 validated at the time that the cells uh, show movements that's consistent with a, a random, uh, random <coughs> movement, random walk. So <clears throat> independently, what, what we have shown also is that a very uh, important signaling gradient, which is established in the posterior part of the embryo and which involves uh, uh, a series of growth factors of the FGF uh, growth factor family, and particularly FGF8. So this uh, 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 signaling was shown with uh, uh, Marie-Claire Delphine that uh, uh, it controls the motility of the cells for if you overexpress uh, the constitutively active MAP kinase, which uh, uh, stimulates FGF signaling, then you increase uh, the motility of the cells, and you can see <coughs> that uh, here on these red tracks. And if you uh, inhibit uh, these kinase uh, in the cells of the posterior presimitic mesoderm, you decrease uh, their motility, suggesting that uh, the gradient of FGF signaling actually controls the movement of the cells, and this random motility gradient that I described and in fact, we had also shown that this gradient is established uh, in the embryo by a fairly uh, unorthodox mechanism, which involves uh, uh, RNA decay. And so the idea is that in the, the precursor area of the tail bud, only uh, the, the cells only transcribe uh, the messenger RNA for uh, FGF in these uh, progenitors. And when they exit this zone, then they stop 
uh, transcribing this messenger RNA, while the embryo continues to elongate. And as a result, the, cells, uh, the, the uh, mRNA in the cells progressively decay. And that leads to the formation of a messenger RNA gradient. So there's no source and sink uh, uh, in this context. It's uh, essentially an intrinsic messenger RNA gradient. And you can see this by, for instance, using an intronic probe, uh, where you see that the, the, uh, prime, the nuclear transcripts are only detected in the tailbud area and not in the prosomatic mesoderm. Whereas if you use an exonic probe, you see that uh, there's plenty of messenger RNA in these cells that do not actively transcribe the messenger RNA. So what's interesting with this particular mode of uh, gradient formation, and so this is, sorry, just an illustration of this gradient. This is uh, uh, the FGF8 ligand, that's a fluorescent in situ mobilization. And this is a readout of FGF signaling phosphorylated ERP, which you can see also shows this nice posterior gradient. <coughs> and what is, is particularly interesting with this mode of uh, uh, gradient formation is that it ensures a tight coordination between uh, the posterior elongation of the embryo and uh, the formation, the maintenance of this gradient along in the, in the presomitic mesoderm. So <coughs> another uh, observations that, observation that we made uh, uh, with Bertrand that he, he more recently characterized in, in more detail is the fact that uh, there is a very significant difference in cellular density in the presomitic mesoderm that you see here, uh, which flanks the axial organ. So this is the neotube and, uh, and the line uh, is the notochord. These are two different stages. That's the chicken embryos, uh, 13 somites and 15 somites. And so in blue, that shows uh, the areas where there is a low cellular density, and brown is high cellular density. So there are two things which are interesting uh, to note here. One is that there is a very uh, striking gradient of cell density along the prosomatic mesoderm with a very low density in the region where the cells are very actively motile. And the other important thing is that uh, the, the prosomatic mesoderm is surrounded by uh, uh, regions of high cellular density, like the lateral plate, the neural tube, and actually uh, the, the forming somites. So suggesting that the cells are, are confined in a, in, a <coughs> in a defined environment of, of higher cell density. And so putting these pieces together, that led us to propose a, a model for the control of uh, axis elongation, which is based on uh, this uh, random motility <coughs> gradient, this uh, so-called cell diffusion gradient, which is controlled by uh, FGF uh, map kinase signaling, which in this context acts as an effective temperature. And so this uh, 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 generates a random uh, movement in the posterior end of the embryo, but because of the confinement that I described and of the uh, higher density, which is found anteriorly, the uh, only direction uh, in which the cells can actually go is the posterior direction. And so the idea is that uh, this mechanism is going to uh, result in a generation of a pressure uh, in the posterior end of uh, the embryo, and this pressure will trigger the posterior elongation movement that uh, uh, we observe. And, uh, and we've been trying to demonstrate uh, this mechanism, which is quite challenging, and so for instance, uh, the sort of experiment that Bertrand did was to block FGF signaling, and in this case, that uh, uh, arrest the, uh, the movement of the cells in the presomatic mesoderm. And if you look now at the motility gradients, so in blue, this is the control gradient, that's the, uh, the, the node, the position of the, the more posterior part of the embryo, this is the somite. You see the motility gradient in blue. So when you overexpress uh, this uh, dominant negative FGF receptor, you, you block the gradient, or you, you flatten the gradient, and you slow down the elongation. When you block with uh, inhibitors of cell movement, like for instance, procainase inhibitors, or blebistatin inhibitors, uh, you get the same result. So you also flatten the gradient, and you uh, 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 downregulate elongation, suggesting that the cell movements are uh, important for elongation of the, the axis. 
And interestingly, when you do the, the converse experiment, that is when you overexpress FG8, so you, you increase the temperature, then what you see is that you uh, uh, flatten the, the gradient, but in, a, in an upper position, so you increase the motility of cells overall, but you also decrease the elongation because you lose uh, the, the directional bias which is imposed by the gradient. And so, <clears throat> so the, the, the next step we uh, wanted to uh, really validate the, the capacity of the uh, of this uh, gradient of uh, 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 posterior uh, random cell motility to uh, trigger movements autonomously. And so this was uh, taken over by uh, Arthur Michaud, who was a PhD student in the lab. We started to uh, design a system of uh, uh, microchannels uh, made of PMS in which you could uh, culture the presomatic mesoderm explants and, and test whether they would uh, elongate also autonomously. So this is just the design of the uh, of these channels, and so these are grooves where you can, which fit uh, uh, the PSN dimension. So they're somewhere between uh, around 75 uh, microns, which is the normal dimension of the, the prismic mesoderm. And then you can cover uh, this with a cover slip. And so the question was uh, whether if you put the prismatic mesoderm in this device, whether you will see the elongation movements, and you will recreate this. Uh, 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 gradient of cell motility. <clears throat> and so what he, what he found is that uh, indeed when you look at the presomatic mesoderm, microdissected presomatic mesoderm in this context, they show some nice uh, elongation movements which are uh, quite uh, uh, resembling the, the, the movements which are seen in vivo. And you can, this is another example, and you can actually measure uh, their elongation and get uh, quantitative data out of this uh, type of explant. And so what uh, Arthur looked at next was uh, uh, whether uh, there was any uh, anterior posterior differences in the control of the elongation movement. So for that he split the prismatic mesoderm into two pieces and cultured either the anterior portion or the posterior portion, so knowing that uh, the posterior portion is the one which is expected to generate the elongation movements. And uh, as you will see, the uh, uh, posterior portion is much more efficient and elongates much more than the anterior one, which is uh, consistent with what I've told you so far about the, the control uh, of the um, elongation movement by the, the posterior prismatic mesoderm. And then he looked at the effect of uh, drugs that inhibit FGF signaling uh, on these explants, either on the full uh, explant, and, and he, sh he saw that uh, when you inhibit FGF signaling in these, uh, in these uh, conditions, you uh, uh, decrease the elongation, the total elongation of the explant. Uh, <clears throat> that's also true to some extent in the, uh, when you treat for the anterior region, but that's much more spectacular for the posterior explants, uh, uh, which uh, elongation is, is very significantly decreased by uh, treating with these drugs that <coughs> detect GF signaling. You can also see this is the quantification of the difference in terms of elongation between the anterior and the posterior regions of the presomatic mesoderm. <coughs> so uh, together this, uh, this uh, argues that this uh, model might explain how you, uh, uh, from a, a group of cells, by uh, imposing this bias uh, diffusion, you can generate uh, uh, a directional elongation, and that's, so these are uh, simulations that, uh, that uh, Ruth Baker did some time ago, where she uh, uh, showed that uh, by taking just a, a square of cells, as shown here, if you let them diffuse, of course, they will go uh, in all directions. But if you impose onto this behavior a gradient of a motogenic substance like, a, like FTF is, in this case, what you get is that you uh, get a directional migration towards uh, the source of the motogenic substance and an inverse gradient of cell density. So that was suggesting, so, so this is very uh, equivalent to what I just showed you for these isolated uh, prismatic mesoderm 
uh, x maps. <coughs> so the question, of course, is that uh, uh, this behavior <coughs> eventually stops once the system reaches a steady state. And uh, uh, that doesn't explain how, in the embryo, you get these uh, movements that are sustained for a very long uh, period of time. And so we, we were uh, actively wondering about how does the embryo sustain these elongation movements. And, and this was uh, <coughs> the, the, the most obvious uh, uh, explanation for that is that there is a constant feeding of cells at the level of gas relation in the table, such that, uh, uh, the, the, as I showed you, the uh, cells that actively transcribe FGF8, which corresponds to the precursors of the pyrosol mesoderm, uh, constantly generate cells that uh, enter the posterior part of the presimitic mesoderm and stop transcribing. And so, so there is uh, uh, biologically a, a, a constant injection of these uh, highly motile cells that can explain the sustained elongation. What is very unclear is how uh, these uh, dynamics are coordinated in the embryo. So uh, uh, how does the, uh, the, the elongation of the presimitic mesoderm control the parallel uh, posterior displacement of uh, this uh, uh, terminal area of the precursors in the in the tail bud. And so, so f oh, that's, that should not be here. But anyhow, uh, so this was just to 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 mention that the 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 model that I, I showed you, we've been uh, uh, working on trying to formalize this uh, with uh, Ido Egef and, and Mahadevan, who've been. Uh, uh, designing a, a continuum model wherein uh, uh, the, the, the presimitic mesoderm is described as a, as a fluid and, uh, and, and the idea is that uh, here the differential fluxes are, are leading to uh, the, the push of a posterior moving boundary and so again the system is, uh, is confined between uh, uh, the lateral plate and the neural tube and uh, more anterior densities uh, anteriorly leading to the posterior push of the boundary. And they also came up with a, a self-centric uh, uh, model, which also uh, recapitulates the, um, uh, the uh, in vivo data. So now coming back to uh, uh, the, the, the control of the injection and how this is coordinated to, uh, to the, the, the process of elongation. So what I try to do is to start to uh, revisitate the uh, experiments that Bertrand had done on the ablation of the posterior uh, presomitic mesoderm. And, uh, and this is uh, one such experiment here where the two stars correspond to the tissue here, which has been removed. This is a transverse section. So you see here the neural tube and the notochord, uh, which is flanked by the paraxial mesoderm. And this is the lateral plate on the side. So what he uh, noted is that when he performs such operations, there is a defect in the convergence of the uh, uh, neural tube and the axial organ. So at the level of the ablation, the uh, axial organs remain wider than uh, at, in areas that have not been uh, operated. And so this can be uh, quantified, and this is just the neural tube and the notochord width. And you see that when you ablate the posterior presynthetic mesoderm, you always get a, a larger a neural tube or notochord. <clears throat> so the next question was uh, whether uh, this was uh, reflecting just the need of a rigid boundary next to the neural tube to promote the convergence extension uh, movement, such that the one that uh, Ray uh, described in his talk. And so what Feng Shu did is to replace the tissue that he removed by a stiff uh, gel. And in this case, as you see here, that does not prevent the widening of the neural tube. So that suggests indeed that uh, maybe there are uh, posterior uh, uh, compressive forces that are acting on uh, the axial organs at this level. And so to test that, what uh, Feng Shu did is to use uh, alginate gels, uh, which he uh, <coughs> injected in the area of the ablation and then he monitored the deformation of these gels. So these gels were made to be very, very soft. And, uh, and, and then he could track in time, in uh, time-lapse movies, the fate of this alginate gel, which would uh, reflect the uh, uh, anisotropy of the deformation. 
And so, as you see here, this is just a series of, of uh, cartoons which represents the deformations experienced by the gel, which has been implanted uh, in the region adjacent to the two posterior proximitic mesoderm in the region of the posterior neural <coughs> tube and upper cord. And what you see is that there is a clear uh, decrease of the width of this gel, which suggests indeed the, the presence of these active compressive forces. And you can quantify uh, this decrease uh, in width uh, as shown here. So <coughs> then uh, uh, Feng Shu went back to some uh, old data from Bertrand where they, they had uh, overexpressed uh, uh, a various construct to interfere with FGF signaling. And what he uh, could find in this context is that uh, uh, what you get also in these uh, uh, embryos in which you overexpress uh, uh, dominant negative FGF receptor, for instance, is that there is a defect in the uh, uh, convergence of the actual organs. That is, the, the neural tube uh, remains larger when you block FGF function, suggesting that uh, this uh, uh, compressive, the, the compressive forces that I just described are likely to be downstream of FGF signaling and, and probably related to the uh, gradient that I just discussed. <coughs> so the conclusion of these experiments is that uh, uh, there is uh, some F there are some FGF uh, dependent uh, compression forces that are involved in uh, pushing on the posterior axial organs, the neural tube and the notochord, uh, which uh, probably will contribute in addition to the convergence extension and the mediolateral cell intercalation movements that take place in these tissues uh, uh, to uh, narrowing the axial organs. And so the, the <coughs> next question is that if you, if you have such a squeezing on the axial organs, then you, you might uh, expect this to impact on the uh, adjacent tissues, and, and particularly on this region here of the paraxial mesoderm uh, progenitors, which is uh, located at the tip, in fact, of uh, the axial organs. And so to look at this, what Feng uh, Shu did is, again, to use the same uh, 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 type of experimental setup where you would perform a posterior ablation, so an ablation of the region of the posterior presomitic mesoderm, the posterior paraxial mesoderm precursors, and replace it by an alginate gel. And uh, <coughs> then he followed the, the, the deformation of the gel in time. And here, what you see is that the deformation is very different from that. Uh, which is observed when the gel is, is uh, uh, introduced just a bit anteriorly in the posterior neural tube. Here, when you put the gel in the, the, the area of the uh, uh, paraxial mesoderm precursor, what you see is uh, uh, are compressive forces but that, that are uh, produced in an orthogonal uh, direction, suggesting that the tissue actually pushes uh, in a posterior direction. And so the interpretation of these experiments is that the, uh, uh, the, the, the idea is that the compressive forces that are generated by the posterior prismatic mesoderm are going to squeeze the actual organ, uh, resulting in a posterior push of the, uh, uh, the, the progenitor domain of the paraxial mesoderm. <coughs> and now to test the role of this progenitor uh, uh, of this push on the progenitor domain, what, uh, what Feng Shu did is to engineer a, a, a very astute uh, a device, a mechanical device, to see uh, what is the actual uh, impact on uh, producing these forces on this uh, region of precursors. And what he uh, uh, did here is to, uh, uh, to, to introduce a pin in the embryo. This is what you see here that can be uh, actioned by a magnet. <coughs> and so this is a transverse uh, section of the embryo. So the pin is introduced vertically. So you can uh, action it with a magnet such that it's going to uh, push on the posterior domain of the embryo. So here you see the posterior end of the embryo. That's uh, uh, the, the, the pin is vertical. And when you apply the magnet, you move the pin, you, you uh, uh, tilt the pin such that it it applies force on the posterior uh, domain of the, the progenitors of the paraxial mesoderm. And so 
this is the result of this experiment. So when you apply the magnet, what you see is that it promotes the elongation of the tissue. And uh, when you look at the, uh, you measure the impact of these manipulations on the fate of cells of the domain of the precursors. These are cells that are labeled in green in this region. Then what you see is that it promotes the lateral dispersion of the cells. And so you can quantify this. So the idea is that <coughs> by applying a force on the domain of the, the posterior of the presynthetic mesoderm and the paraxial mesoderm, you're going to promote their uh, exit from uh, the precursor region and thus stimulate uh, uh, the, the addition of new highly uh, motile cells to the posterior presynthetic mesoderm. So finally, what this suggests is that uh, the, the cell diffusion gradient not only controls this uh, posteriorly oriented movement, which I showed earlier on, but also uh, uh, is involved in applying uh, these compressive forces onto uh, the, the posterior axial organs, re resulting in the posterior push of the domains that contains the, the parasitic progenitors. And that acts as a, as a reservoir for uh, uh, highly motile cells. And so what uh, this leads to is to the establishment of a positive feedback uh, leading to the emigration of cells from this area, which will contribute to further sustain the, uh, uh, the posterior uh, random motility gradient, which is important for uh, elongation. And I just want to show you this movie again. So, can we shut down? <clears throat> Just now that you have this, uh, uh, this scheme in mind that you can compare to what happened to, to the embryo. So this is the region of the precursor. That's the blue region of the precursors. And you see the idea is that uh, uh, this uh, active uh, movements here are going to generate some compression, pushing this uh, uh, domain uh, uh, further and uh, stimulating the immigration uh, in the, uh, in the motile territory. And um, <clears throat> I just want to, to finish with a, a few experiments that are uh, uh, still underway. And, uh, so a so big question, of course, in this model and what we've been uh, trying to demonstrate for, for several years now is, uh, is the generation of force by the, the system, by the elongating presumptive mesoderm. And <clears throat> Arthur also started to uh, uh, become interested in this question. And what he did is to set up an experimental system where he can uh, culture uh, uh, developing chicken embryos onto an agar gel uh, and uh, implant into these uh, developing chicken embryos uh, cantilevers <coughs> with uh, measure forces. So these are uh, this type of cantilevers. They are made of very uh, thin uh, glass needle uh, to which uh, a small sheet of aluminum is glued. <coughs> and, uh, and so uh, the, the, the cantilever is implanted in the embryo the embryo is also covered by a layer of mineral uh, oil to prevent the dehydration. And uh, what is monitored is the displacement of the cantilever, which uh, is expected to, uh, 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 to help quantify the, the, the force which is produced by the tissue. And so using this approach, he was able to uh, design uh, cantilevers of different uh, stiffness, which he implanted in the embryos, and so what you, that's what you see here. This is one such cantilever. This is the tip of uh, the embryo, the elongating, so the, the practical mesoderm precursor, which I just uh, shown a bit earlier, and uh, this is the, the just a red dot to uh, monitor the elongation. And so then he could track the displacement of the cantilever, and so when you see that when you use like a, a, a three millinewton uh, per meter. Uh, uh, stiffness cantilever, then uh, you have uh, not much of an impact on the elongation. <coughs> but now if you use a higher a cantilever of higher stiffness, then what you see is that uh, the embryo is essentially stalled. And so in this way, he was able to identify the, the, the stalling force, uh, which is produced by, um, by these embryos. <coughs> 
and you can also quantify this uh, starting force. So uh, here it's just uh, uh, the elongation the, with a, a, a very um, a low stiffness cantilever compared to a, a high stiffness cantilever, and you can see that it saturates uh, very quickly, whereas uh, there's not much of an impact on the low stiffness ones. And so eventually, uh, he was able to characterize uh, the stoning stress and, and show that it's around uh, 100 times four. And that, uh, interestingly, it also uh, seemed to uh, depend on the elongation speed, such that the, the, the faster uh, the embryo, the, the higher uh, the stoning stress, which is detected in, in this context. So I'm going to stop here. I just want to acknowledge the, the work of uh, Two people. So Arthur was a great PhD student in the lab, and also uh, Kai Shu, who is uh, co-supervised by uh, Mahadevan and, and myself, and has been doing some great work and is moving next year uh, to start his own lab in, at the Gerber Institute in uh, Cambridge. <coughs> I'll stop here. Thank you. Well, it's just that it increases the, the their movement, their random movement. So they, they shoot protrusions in, in all directions. So is there like an optimal velocity for like maximal extension? So so we don't know. So, so I haven't talked about this. That's something that we started to look into, but don't have a good understanding. It seems that when you dissociate the cells and you look at their motility in vitro, uh, uh, irrespective of their position along the gradient, the cells have the same motility in vitro. What changes is the number of cells that moves. And so, so that's, that's how we, we uh, understand the gradient. But experimentally, it's, it's not uh, yet demonstrated that we need to do a lot more work. Your hand and then I, I wonder whether you have an idea of the magnitude of the force that is in this direction and the one which is in this direction. So I had the intuition that based on the, this motility gradient, this force will be low, this force will be smaller than the one that is in this direction. Yeah. So whether you had a gradient, for example, of ECM that, that can compensate for, for this mm -hmm. and make it stiffer at the bottom or <coughs> We, we don't have a, a, a good understanding. So Sean, who is in Madevan's lab, who must be around here, and, and Feng Shu, they, they developed a, a new system which is much more performant than this, that maybe will allow to measure this, this, the compressive force uh, uh, onto the actual organ. It's actually technically more complicated because uh, the embryo moves, uh, extends posteriorly. Whereas if you, if you want to measure the, the force produced by elongation, just need to put the cantilever at the tip and monitor elongation. But if you, if you put it on, uh, in the uh, uh, orthogonal direction, you need to compensate for the, uh, the drift of the elongation movement. So, so we, we don't know. We, we have some idea of the, uh, uh, the strength of the force, um, which is involved in the, at least for instance, in the isolated uh, uh, elongating uh, chrysomatic mesoderm after measured some, some uh, uh, stresses of like 9 pascal, I think, which are 10 times lower than the whole embryo. But we're still struggling with the, uh, I, I wouldn't speak much about the, the numbers. Our uh -huh. and then depth and then <coughs> uh, <coughs> So first of all, the dynamics of elongation, does it reach certain rate, perhaps coincidence of the rate of some genesis and then slows down, or does it always does it accelerate? And the related question is, how do you stop it? How do you stop it? Because you have now a gradient of motility, yeah. you have gradient of FGF. How do you stop this process? So, so, so that's interesting. So we showed uh, uh, a while ago with uh, Nicolas Denon uh, that uh, the, the embryos actually, the elongation stops around 25 somites. And the arrest of elongation uh, uh, corresponds to uh, the onset of Hox genes, because we've also shown that Hox genes control the, the rate of ingression of cells. The more posterior genes prevent the cells to gastrulate. So basically, it, it essentially turns, you know, it, it shuts down the, the supply in motile cells. That's, that's what we think Hox genes are doing in this context. And so 
once you've done that, once you have no more supply, what, what will happen is that the system has got some inertia and will continue to elongate for some time, and then it will stop. And depending when you actually shut the system down, it's what ultimately will control uh, the, the total number of somites that you will see. That's, that's the ratio between the elongation and, the, and somatogenesis, because somatogenesis, or so the process of segment formation, is under a different control, and so it continues even though the, 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 the axis elongation arrests. Uh, <coughs> I was wondering if you could comment on what's happening with ECM synthesis along the utility gradient. So is it, is it constant accumulating? No, it's, it's not constant. It's, uh, it increases, at least for fibronectin, <coughs> it increases uh, towards the somitic region. So, and, and the fibronectin becomes organized in, in fibrils, and Ray knows this much better, but uh, the, initially, it's not very well organized in the very highly uh, motile domain. Akanshi, okay, um, last question. So the cells that are, that are entering the, the motility, the high motility region through gastrulation event, are they also following the FGF gradient? They, how, do they, how do they find their way into, into the presomatic me mesoderm? Well, they're just adjacent to it. Okay. They just drop into the... Pre Probably what happens is an epithelium to mesenchyme conversion because there, there's also this uh, dimension. So the, the precursor region is, is an epithelium, at least early on. It's less well characterized at these stages. And then the, the cells in the presomitic mesoderm are, are mesenchymal. So, and that's, that's what gastrulation is, is essentially this epithelium to mesenchyme conversion. So, and, and the cells that go in the axial region, <coughs> they, they then escape. So these. They don't have an FGF gradient anymore. Well, the the gradient is intrinsic. Okay. That's you know that's the whole point is that it's it's inside the cells. So and and that overall that generates a gradient which is a gradient of a diff diffusible substance. But probably the most important aspect of the gradient is is within the cells and local like the the, the upper aspect. Last question. Um, what is the that in the So, sorry? Like, uh, if you, when you like, perturb the FDF signal, you mm -hmm. see the change um, of the EPM. We haven't looked at these things in detail, so, so I don't know. Do you think that the uh, displacement is mainly due to 